The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We're in crime today, of course, and um, we're going to be talking about Jack the Ripper. And uh, we have a guest on that's written uh, a few books, as far as I see, on it. Um, and his latest book came out in April, I believe, of last year, sometime. And mm -hmm. it's called Jack the Ripper Suspect, Dr. Francis Tumblety. So, uh, Michael Hawley, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, now, we've had several people on uh, to talk about Jack the Ripper. And um, first of all, let's get, you, get a little bit about you. Why did you... Uh, get so involved in this that you're actually writing books? Well, the uh, one of the things that I've always had a passion for is research and discovery. And my background, I, yes, I was a I was a Navy pilot for a while, but also part of my science was that uh, my master's research was in strategic free and paleontology. And so I was always into uh, the research and discovery of certain fossils. And, uh, and I was quite involved with the peer review process with that. Uh, with Dr. Bat in this area where I live. And then, uh, so I, I just love discovery. And also with the, my family history, I love, you know, I'm a, a genealogist. So, uh, what happened was in 2009, I was, I had a, uh, another book that I was waiting for publishing. And it was during the financial crisis. And so, uh, the, the publisher was kind of hemming and hawing on certain, uh, niche books and which mine was part of that. Uh, so, I was uh, biting at the bit, and I saw actually saw a show on TV on Mystery Quest about uh, Jack the Ripper. And what happened was is that there was a suspect, and I'd never heard of, was Francis Tumbley, who was uh, 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 buried just an hour and a half away from me. Here in uh, I, I'm in Buffalo, New York, and this was in Rochester, New York. And so that uh, piqued my interest. And the person that uh, what happened was is that uh, Stuart Evans, who was now been doing research for 50 years in the Jack the Ripper. He's, he's one of the top experts. In 1992, someone uh, that knew him gave him some uh, Ripper letters, and one of them he'd never seen, and it was a big shock to him because it was from the Chief Inspector Littlechild, who was the Chief Inspector of Scotland Yard's special branch at the time, and that who was in the know. He was always in the meetings, even though special branch was indirectly involved with the Ripper murders, that uh, he was involved in, in, in a... A famous uh, journalist at the time, George Sims, asked him uh, who he thought Jack the Ripper was. This was a hindsight. So 1888 were the murders, and this was 1913. And he says, well, uh, uh, the Sims said, how about this Dr. D, who was, I think, I believe, drew it. But he said, I'm not sure about a Dr. D, but then here's, uh, um, he said that, but a Dr. T tumbled in. He was, a, he was a very likely suspect. Well, that shocked Stuart Evans because he had never heard of Tumbledy. And then so then he started doing his research, and the next two years he found uh, quite a bit of material and had a book, which became quite famous. But then, uh, so then that was what the 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 show was about, and so it, it again I got involved, and so I just I found found uh, his web or his grave site, and so I went there and did a little YouTube. But that got me involved, and then I realized by that by 2009. Most of the experts uh, dismissed him really as even a serious suspect, not maybe not even a suspect because it was such limited evidence. So, well, time to uh, jump in the business. And so my research was a different kind of style. Uh, with physical science, we kind of focus on data. We focus on the physical evidence. And then what we're looking for is to see if someone does a, a research article that – you know, the, the arguments used, you know, you have both, the arguments need to be both sound and valid. So a valid argument would be that the evidence follows directly to the conclusion, but if there's limited evidence, cherry picking, then that, uh, that, um, that argument's not sound. And so there was limited evidence, and so both sides had pretty, pretty valid arguments. So every time I start searching, I discover new things, and, um, uh, all of it is damning evidence and supporting Stuart Evans. And so in 2016, I had written my book, The Ripper's Haunts, which had a, a mountain of evidence. And that actually changed the minds, hearts and minds of the, uh, these experts, especially Paul Begg, who's the big reviewer. And he, he said that my book was head and shoulders above the rest of the books because of this new evidence. 
So then I got uh, to uh, do uh, a lecture in Liverpool and Baltimore and some other places. And then lo and behold, there's more and more stuff I've, we've been finding on um, on uh, Francis Tumbledy, which required another book. And then uh, so and then in the meantime, then we found 900 pages of new uh, sworn testimony, 47 um, um, sworn testimonies, uh, which was. Uh, that was uh, because of a, a, a lawsuit in 1903 on Tumblety. All these eyewitness accounts of Tumblety in the last 20 years, and so it's, and and so that's kind of how I basically got involved, and I'm continuing. We're still finding more stuff. Well, you know, um, before we get into some of that, I, I would imagine a lot of the evidence is hard to come by, and and uh, reliable, and of course witnesses. Well. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to happen. Um, right. So when you when you come across different pieces of evidence, um, how do you judge what's how much weight you you can give it? Corroboration. Uh, I think a beautiful example of uh, corroboration would be uh, what we found out is that there was an interview of a person right after Francis Tumbley sneaked out of the country uh, back to New York City. Uh, because nobody saw the murders, and so they arrest. They actually arrested him on a misdemeanor charge of uh, gross indecency, and he was a he was rich back then. So he basically posted bail, sneaked out of the country, and then when he got here, then uh, the the papers were interviewing people that knew him, and one was this uh, Colonel Dunham said that he remembered Tumbley having this collection of uterus specimens during the Civil War. And uh, that would be pretty damning for someone that hears Jack the Ripper taking the uterus out of two of the women. So uh, that article, a lot of uh, some other experts had looked at it and then basically said that since uh, Dunham had, uh, during the Civil Wars, he was basically a spy. So he had to be an expert at lying. And so because he was good at lying, therefore he's wrong and we don't have to trust it. And they were saying that there's no evidence to support it. Well, that was in, uh, here's Colonel Dunham saying that he saw Tumbledy, Tumbledy gave a medical lecture, uh, in 1861 when he, he came to, when the, that the onset of the Civil War. Here's Tumbley, who's uh, a, an Indian herb doctor, actually, at the time, but he claimed that he had surgical experience and he was a surgeon, so he wanted to convince General McClellan at the time that he was, uh, he was a surgeon, so he, he'd given a medical lecture to the officers. And Colonel Dunham was one of those officers. So he wanted to convince them. And that's what surgeons did at the time. They gave medical lectures with their these anatomical specimens that they made, them, made themselves. And so what I found out was since that was about July, August 1861 when the lecture occurred, uh, he was just in New York City. And I found this article that was in one of the New York uh, newspapers complaining about Tumbley's office having pictures of anatomical specimens all over his windows, complaining about it, and then nobody had ever seen that. And so then what I found out was, that was 1861, and here's uh, Tumbley giving these this an anatomical lecture. He since had uh, left Washington, D.C., and he made his way to Buffalo, New York, 1863, and uh, which nobody knew since we did this research, is he was hanging out with John Wilkes Booth in 1863 in, in Buffalo, when Booth was at a theater, and Tumbley loved the theater, and this newspaper article talked about this, the Buffalo newspaper saying that Tumbley was giving uh, anatomical lectures with thespian es emphasis. So we're finding corroborating evidence to support that Tumbley had this interest. But also, just the, in uh, the incentive for Tumbley to have this collection wasn't because he was just kind of a bizarre character, which he was. It's just that he was trying to convince uh, the the uh, military officers that he was a credible surgeon, which did not work. But that's another story. So I'm looking. I always look for this uh, corroborating evidence to support that. And then uh, so um, and I mean, there's a, a number of things that we have also. Michael, uh, I'm gonna sort of. This is the police officer, I guess, inside me. The the 700 pages. Where where has this been all this time? Uh, and it was never seen since 1908. What happened was, is uh, while I was uh, this last year, uh, actually uh, 2017, uh, 
after writing the Rippers Haunts and and working on my uh, some more material, I got contacted by a person, a uh, photographer uh, in from St. Louis, that he want he was in masters his masters program. He wanted to be a director. He was already doing film, being the behind the camera, uh, but he wanted to do the director role. So he said that. Uh, he wanted to do uh, a little uh, documentary on Tumblety, and he knows that Tumblety had died in 1903 in St. Louis. And since he was there, do you think there was something that he could find to help him out? And uh, some original material. And I said, well, actually, yes, because what happened was is when Tumblety died uh, at the uh, uh, at the uh, uh, the Catholic Hospital there, St. John Catholic Hospital in St. Louis, he was there for a month, but. Uh, what happened is he made out a will, and in that will, he had about $3.4 million of today's value in a uh, in the New York City bank. But, you know, for, for the last 10 years of his life, what he did is he lived as a, a homeless person, yet he still was a millionaire. But when he was there, what he did was he bequeathed about a third of that money to his family members, and he screwed the rest of them. And he would give ten thousand dollars of nineteen oh three money to a niece, and the two brothers got nothing. So he was really qu- quite a vindictive kind of guy. So what happened was when he died, all the family members they uh, they sued the will, basically saying that he was uh, claiming that he was not of sound mind and body. Therefore, the will is null and void. Therefore, all, therefore, all family members get equal amount. So that court case lasted for five years. And so I told uh, the person. Michael Sanop was his name. I said, uh, if we can find out what the family members knew about Tumblety to show that he was not of sound mind and body that never made the papers, that could be pretty damning for any other things. And then so he went searching and he had to find search in a, a number of different places and he found all the state court cases and of that of that case or the and uh, he found nine hundred pages of. 40, 47, basically 47 sworn testimonies of Tumblety in his last 20 years of his life. Most of it focused on the last few years, but some of it, for example, one of them was a young man that he, that we never knew, we never knew that Tumblety from 1881 to 1901 would go every Mardi Gras to New Orleans. And he, and he was a, and he had a, a one thing is we found out nobody knew that he was a hermaphrodite. That was a big shocker. And then, but uh, in this case of this young Rick, uh, Richard Norris, he admitted that when he was, you know, 1920, he would prostitute for money. And although by the mid 1890s he was working for the police department, or 1880s actually, to, uh, all the way to 2010, he was working for the police department at the time, and he was actually married. But when he was younger, he would do that for extra money. So Tumbley had a big crush on him, basically, and would meet up with him every year. And in 1881. Uh, here is 1905, the interview uh, in front of the, you know, with the attorneys in front of the, the judge, and he was saying that in 1881, when Tumble, he met Tumbley for the first couple months, Tumbley locked the door on him in his room, took one of his knives. He actually, a month before, he showed uh, in, uh, Tumbley showed uh, Richard Norris in his travel chest a collection of surgical knives. And then one of those knives he put to his throat and said that, um, and he, he was basically going to molest him. But he, but, uh, so he, just before that time, what he did was, is that, uh, Richard Norris had a cigarette in his mouth. So he pulled the cigarette out of his mouth and he said, there's two things bad for young men, cigarettes and streetwalkers. They should all be disemboweled. And so Scotland Yard never knew about this sworn testimony. Um, this was completely new, even to us, that, uh, so, uh, and the person, the archivist that had this material said the last person that checked this out was 1908. Hmm. So, and and there's a bunch more. I mean, it's just filled with information on his his narcissism, his antisocial personality behavior. Um, he would uh, really kind of bizarre things that he would do. So, and also what it did, it showed that he... Uh, uh, the, a lot of barbers would not work on his hair because he had these sores that wouldn't go away, and uh, there were hints of neurosyphilis. Oh. And, and he was quite misogynist, right? Oh, extremely misogynist. And that's the other thing that uh, these uh, this 900 pages corroborated. One time, uh, two, his lawyers, one of his lawyers, his attorney at uh, in Baltimore, 
uh, a uh, Frank Widener said that in 1902, this is a year before he uh, he had died, he was uh, Tumbledy was in his office, and Tumbledy would sometimes pass out and faint. You know, he had that kidney and heart disease, and so. But uh, Widener let him sit in his office, and every time a woman would come in, uh, Tumbledy would always have a newspaper in his hand. He would put his face, uh, the newspaper in front of his face when a woman would go by. And then he said one time there was a woman sitting in his office. This is Frank Widener. Then Frank Widener said that he had a phone call, and there was only one phone in the building, so he had to leave. And Tumbley was in his office, and that woman was in the office. So uh, Frank Widener left and came back, and that wooden woman was outside the office and said that, asked uh, uh, the woman, why did you leave my office? And she says, well, that man in there, I am afraid of. And uh, he threatened me. He, as in, uh, his mannerisms scared me so much, and uh, so I, I will not be in that room with that uh, that man again. Yeah. And so here's Tumblety, like he, you know, again, a year before he died, he still has this extreme uh, hatred of women, threatening behavior towards women. And that's yeah. the other thing that I found out some more other threatening kind of behaviors that he had with these women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did, so. he, did he run for president? No, I'm not going <laughs> to. Right. But you know, one thing I have to say, how about the, um, okay, when you, let's go back to his gross indecency charge in, in, in the UK. Now, that okay. was for having homosexual um, acts where he was caught, so probably somewhere in public, which it was still against the law back then. And I also, I, when I look at that, and I also look at, um, he had quite the relationship with the writer, um, um, Kane, you know, the guy that had was one of yeah. the most popular writers at the time, first one to sell a million books. And um, they were suggest it was suggested they were having an affair, that they were yeah. doing this. So if, if he's pr- prone to be homosexual, why do you think he was killing women? Because homosexuals aren't gay because they hate women. I mean, he right. obviously was misogynist and had no, he thought of a woman as a lesser species or something. You know, he had something in his mind that was haywire. But um, if he was having sex with other men, why would he care about um, killing the woman in these ways? Well, a couple things. One is that um, the, you know how some people will say that, let's say, for serial serial, serial killers, that uh, if they are gay, they tend to go after young men. and But that's more on a sadosexual, as a sexual impulse, and also you'd be a younger man when your sexual desires are greater. Tumbledy was different. What he was, he had this extreme hatred, and not of all women, only widow or maid. He hated women that could lure young men away from their intended lovers, as in him. Oh. And so, and so what, and this is what I have uh, a number of testimonies. I actually have some of those in my book, but of, uh, of him doing that. And then I found a pattern throughout there. And there was a, a, a forensic, uh, scientist, criminal profiler, if you know him, Dr. Brent Turvey. What he did was he looked at the, the victim, Jack the Ripter victims. And what he, he did not find, and also, uh, Dr. William Eckert, neither of them found uh, any sadistic behavior because they could see that these women were uh, they were first killed bef- and then they were mutilated. It wasn't that there was a sadistic behavior. It was, and so what what uh, Brent Turvey said is he saw two things. He saw anger retaliatory, hatred in the motive, and he also saw reassurance oriented. And with that anger anger retaliatory, that fits Tumbledy to a T. Tumbledy hated. Uh, again, uh, attractive women, especially prostitutes, because Tumbley always hanged out, hung out in the slums, every city he went to, and he would always, that's exactly where the prostitutes were, and he hated them. And then, uh, so, what what happened, though, is Tumbley, around 1880, 1881, there was a complete change of behavior. He changed how he traveled. He always traveled to places that had hot baths, and he would... Uh, and then so he stopped his business. So before he, you know, like his first, he had six autobiographies. So his first autobiography, just after the Civil War, he was bragging about his Indian herb doctor business. But then the next one had said there was absolutely zero references to Indian herb doctor. It was all about surgeons because he, he believed he was the disciple of Abernathy, who was this British English surgeon. And then so, 
But one of the things is is that that match, that hatred, is what Tumbly would have. So with with uh, Brett Turvey was talking about is any serial killers that are anger retaliatory. The idea of being gay doesn't fit. It's more you're blaming. Let's say, for example, this is not Tumbly, but let's say you know you hate your mother, so you're going to kill people that look like your mother. Something to that effect. But for Tumbly, it was. Um, there was a, a switch that was flipped, and, be, uh, and uh, it could very well have been connected to this uh, um, his syphilis that w- he would likely had with the neurosyphilis, or it's just what they call that narcissistic impulse, that rage. Because what he said was, is in the year of the murders, uh, the murders were 1888 in the autumn. In the January 1888, he told the Toronto Reporter that he was in constant dread of sudden death because of kidney and heart disease. And so that kidney and heart disease, and here's Jack the Ripper, took three organs out of these women, the kidney, the heart, and the uterus twice. And here's we have Tumbledee had, you know, had uh, 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 reported to have a collection of uterus specimens, and then he had this reason for the kidney and heart. And then so, and then, uh, so it was more as what uh, kind of conforms to what Dr. Turvey says, as opposed to a sadosexual thing. So, but I always tell people, it's like, I'll never be 100% convinced of anyone. If Jack the Ripper was sadosexual, Francis Tumbley is not your man. Right. But, but what I see, same thing as what Dr. Turvey sees, is I don't see any sadistic behavior, and I do see this. He attacks what makes women different than men, in a way. Oh, what did he when when you said he he basically had both sex organs, so he had. Do you know what he had? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, we have the sworn testimony of the uh, the Undertaker. Oh, wow! <laughs> so, and this was quite the shocker. What? Well, like so, uh, a couple things. One is that another ba- uh, New Orleans attorney, uh, Robert Simpson, uh, was uh, had given sworn testimony that testimony that in his office. Tumbley had passed out, and his pants fell down, and he, and he saw that he saw that his hips looked like a woman, and and all of them said that his penis was the size of the tip of your thumb, and that uh, even the Richard Norris, the one that got molested by him, told him that he gave the whole story about uh, it was uh, uh, that it, you know it was about the tip of the size of his thumb. So he, uh, but he what he got on the on the bed. And this is Norris talking, so it was like. He wanted Norris to penetrate him, but then the uh, the under uh, so the the attorney was saying that he uh, had male shoulders. You know, he had a he was tall, looked male, but then he had f- small female hands. His voice was high pitched, female like, and his hips were female. And he had this thing. So uh, when he they revived him eventually, uh, he they also heard rumor by the police in Baltimore that he was a hermaphrodite. So he directly asked Tumbley, and Tumbley told him that that's something that has cursed him all of his life. And so then the Undertaker had said that uh, it was the strangest thing he ever seen of this man because he had never seen anything like it. With the with the 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 legs were straight, so he didn't uh, uh, couldn't he didn't open up to see any kind of vaginal things. But he saw the penis was really small, and then he was clean in the face. And one of the things that Tumbley had since age thirty, in his thirties, he would. Uh, put uh, wax his mustache completely black since his 30s. And then what happened was the undertaker said that when he cleaned his mustache and his hair, his hair was completely white, his mustache, and one of his mustaches popped right off, and there was this big sore under there, and there was a big sore in his throat as well. And that was the thing, is there were, uh, that uh, the number of the barbers would say that these sores, that would never go away. Oh, sexy. Now, um... One thing now, a, a lot of ripperologists had said the problem with Tumblety is was his age. Um, how do you right. how do you answer that? Uh, same thing as, as still again with uh, Doctor Turvey. When you're looking at uh, sadosexual, this uh, sexual desire and drive, that's at peaks at 19 to 30. But in this case, with anger reta- retaliatory, this hatred, and when he it. Uh, in 1888 is when he uh, was convinced, you know, he was in constant dread of sudden death. And he, what he did, he was Catholic. And what um, I have a couple of things in the book talking about, he, he always said that women were the curse of the land. And back then, a lot of Catholics uh, 
incorrectly, misogynistically uh, believed that it wasn't Adam that committed the original sin. It was Eve deceiving Adam. And so Tumbley was in that group where would blame that. So all the disease, every, all the curse of the land, you know, because the original sin has caused all the negative things, like diseases. So he blamed the women. And then, in this case, here he's uh, uh, having this uh, case. And what, was, what, again, was your question? Because I was going to go right into that. Uh, his age. Oh, his age. And so what happens is, is uh, that is the time in, in the mid-50s where he is now worried that he's going to die. And he believed, and he, and he hated getting older, but it would be right at the time for anger retaliatory, that hatred, that, that attack, that mutilation. And then what you're looking at also, uh, uh, if it was Nero Syphilis really at the time that was happening, in the 1880s, you see his behavior changing. So then with uh, what we see is after 1893, he no long, he, all he did was stayed in those slums, wore uh, this thick coat, never showered, and uh, here it is from 1893 to, or 1895 at least, to 1902, stayed in the slums, move around all the time, and he still had um, upwards of $3 million in the bank. And so, he, and so you could see his behavior was just completely changed. So his mind wasn't in perfect anyway. So it wouldn't be a case of, let's say, a sadosexual serial killer that continues to kill or started early or whatever has this, has this burning desire. And what he also said, Dr. Turvey said, is with anger retaliatory, if they get uh, almost get caught, that tends to stop them. And he almost got caught. He did not leave England, by the way, because of being uh, suspected of the Ripper murders. That was all because of his gross indecency. Right. It was because of his, you know, behavior and arrests and stuff. Well, what about um, what about his looks? Like he didn't really fit any of the descriptions at the time. So, you know, did he disguise himself or something? Because uh, did, did he did, were the mustache maybe fake? Did he just pop uh, them off? <laughs> uh, no. There are a couple things. First of all, nobody saw the murders. Okay. So that means there really isn't any eyewitness testimony. Yeah. But what we do see, and you have interviewed Tom Westcott. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. And then Tom and I, we, uh, you know, we work well together. And I, I enjoy Tom's books. And then but one of the things with the suspects is that when you look at all the suspects, they do vary. And I do have two accounts in the book about uh, very tall suspects. Uh, but in the case, uh, remember... There was this thing called the Innocence Project uh, that the uh, you know the School of Law at Yeshiva University did, and what they did is they took 239 cases where there was a conviction based on eyewitness testimony. So the and so eyewitness testimony caused the conviction, meaning the person that gave the eyewitness testimony was convinced right. enough to allow this person to go to jail. They and 73 percent of those were overturned because of DNA evidence. Here it is, 73% of 239 cases modern day. So as an eyewitness testimony, basically, and then this is like uh, um, that you can't count upon it as well. Right. So, oh, yeah. so, there's, so what for me is that if you look at some of the suspects, even when uh, we have uh, – one of the things that I never do is I never go against any other suspects because I love – it's. To me, it's all about reliable knowledge. Everybody needs to research all these people and keep on researching with uh, proper peer review as best we can uh, to get the bigger picture. Because I don't believe we'll ever find definitively who's Jack the Ripper. Because even uh, you know the the ideas of DNA just can't work. So, but we are getting closer and closer and finding more and more th uh, about it. So, but when you look at a lot of the uh, even the uh, hindsight with some of the uh, Scout and Yard officials that even with Swanson and, and even with uh, Anderson, they're basing it on eyewitness testimony. Well, here we're finding out that eyewitness testimony, even though you're convinced that that person's convinced, they might not have, one, they might not have seen Jack the Ripper. That might have been another John. In a lot of cases where, let's say, somebody was with that, you know, they don't know for sure if that was the particular uh, prostitute or uh, unfortunate and that if it was, maybe Jack the Ripper waited for they did their business, and then he attacked. And so we don't know for sure. So with eyewitness testimony, it's, you know, I don't think that is a big issue with Tumblebee.
One thing I wanted to get into was, um, now, what kind of doctor was he? Like, you talk about the Indian herb, and you talk about different things, but I also see in his history that he was supposed to be, uh, you know, a pretty popular doctor and won an award, right? He was awarded the Cross um, of the Legion of Honor, right? So, right. Right. So he was a... He, he, what was he? Like, was he a surgeon, a doctor? Uh, what? Well, he had, he never went to medical school. And uh, so what happened was, is in 1847, uh, he was not, some people were thinking that he was raised in Rochester, New York. No, he was raised in uh, Ireland. And, and I found out where he was in Ireland. And then, so at age 17 is when, during right, the peak of the potato famine is when he came over on a famine ship. With uh, but the, he some of his family members were already here. He was eleven. He was the eleventh child. So mom and dad, he came with mom and dad. But some of the older brothers and sisters were already here, and that's why he went to Rochester because that's where some of them were. And then so when he got here by 1850, there was this French disease doctor who he called himself Lispinard because that's a French name, but his his name was Reynolds. But he was actually, uh, you know, for curing French diseases, sexual diseases. And Tumbley was his uh, work for him. And Tumbley would go to different cities and kind of, uh, you know, get his material in some of the city directories. And he would travel for him and do things for him. But then 1853 is when this Indian herb doctor, this charismatic guy named R.J. Lyons, came into uh, into uh, Rochester and opened up an office right next to Lisbonard's office, but Lisbonard had one of these uh, smaller building. This was the big arcade building, and back then it was it was a huge mall at the time, it, and it was like it was expensive, and here's R.J. Lyons, just uh, just very charismatic, and he would have lines of people, and it attracted Tumblety immediately. By 18, so 18, that was 1853. By 1856, Tumblety is on his own across the border into London, Ontario, with this, opened up his first Indian herb doctor office. And it was actually the first time we have record of him uh, being uh, nasty to a, a female patient as well. But then he went through Canada, and by, th- by 1860, he had over a million dollars in the bank of today's value. He was so good at it. He would go into cities uh, circus style. He was like the P.T. Barnum of the day, and he would go in there, and he, would att- he was just a bright, brilliant guy. He was charismatic he would attract the rich people and that um but he had these things he would he would continue he had these young men that he would kind of molest but also that he had this misogyny that you could follow and then so so he was basically trained as an indian herb doctor which is an herbal guy but it was more it was a, a scam as well so back then allopathic medicine uh was actually nasty it hurt when you went to the doctor. It was better out than in. And so, uh, and so, but herbal medicine made you feel better. They claimed it cured all. Tumblety always claimed he could cure everything, but it really couldn't. But it just made you feel better. And so, initially, that made uh, you know the people would go to him. But then, by the time they realized he was a quack, he was gone to another city, and he, he's got all this money. And he continued to do that process. He would go city to city to city. And so, but what happened was, is he was, he would always put MD at the back of his name. And so, uh, he claimed that he had medical experience. And so then he actually got in trouble a couple times because they, in court, they showed that he did not go to medical school. This was 1860. He had a court case. But then 1861, here's where he's going to, uh, uh, Washington DC, uh, right after the first battle of the Bull Run. And he's trying to convince the, the, uh, uh, General McClellan, that he's a surgeon, that he should be, uh, you know, commissioned. That would be a coup because what would happen was, is because he never had any medical school, if the McClellan hired him as a surgeon, that's like uh, bypassing med school. Now you are an official surgeon. So even in his autobiography after that, he talks about that he, you know, uh, was going to help out General M- uh, McClellan, but then he decided not to or something to that effect. So then he claimed in the early 19, late 1860s, he went to uh, France, and that's where he got this medal and helped out uh, as a surgeon, as ambulance stuff. And he also said that he was, as I said, that he said claimed to be a, a disciple of Abernathy, who was an English surgeon. And the, the difference, he said that he was kind of a surgeon on steroids, meaning 
don't go use the knife first because back then, you know, prior to bacteria, you know, uh, antibiotics, you know, half the time they would die. So in this case, what he would do is he would say medicine first and then the last, if that nothing else works, then use the knife. That's kind of what Tumbley was trying to say. And then, uh, so, but, so then he's, uh, this new, uh, 900 pages of uh, eyewitness testimony. When he was on his deathbed, or near his deathbed that first month, the person that would come visit one of his doctors, he would, uh, Tumbley would have conversation with him about surgery, amputations, and so the, the, uh, the attorney asked that, that surgeon if Tumbley had medical knowledge, and that surgeon says absolutely, and he was very interest in, interested in surgery such as the the amputations and so you can see Tumbley. Uh, then when you look at his autobiographies, he wanted to, uh, uh, and he, he, even when he was retired, he want he always said that he was the son of a surgeon, which he was not, but and also he was a retired surgeon from the English Army, the British Army, which he was not, but that he he already had the money, so he loved to be considered the Doctor Tumbley. Wow. Um, do you think that um, his like mental problems, like do you, do you think that he had issues, like you know, obviously he was sick with something. Do you think this is the reason it affected his mind, and that's why he didn't use any of the money he had? Uh, at the end, I mean, he did at the beginning, well, especially he would spend a lot of money to make money when he was in his business, and so. Uh, he'd always advertise, spend the money, but it made him a lot of money. But by the 1800s, then we see it's like it's silent because he's no longer advertising. And uh, every, anytime we'd see him in the papers when he got in trouble, let's say he got arrested for sodomy, it's something to that effect. Like Toronto in 1881, he got arrested for so sodomy. So in these cases, and so he was... Um, but by 1888, he still wear, wore pretty good clothes. And his, his Baltimore attorney has said that uh, he started becoming his Baltimore attorney about 1894. And he said that Tumbley was wearing regular clothes, old clay clothes. But by 1898 to, uh, to 1900 is when he stopped. It was all these, it was kind of disgusting kind of clothes. Or it was just this thick coat kind of thing that he would wear. And then he'd walk around and um, even the New Orleans attorney said that he didn't want to be with Tumbley, but he, uh, Tumbley would talk him into going to lunch with him, and Tumbley would be taking a fork and scraping his beard, uh, and then what he would do is he would have his attorney read his autobiography, the good parts, over and over and over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but yeah, it was. So you could see that the mind was kind of a, a strange uh, something. Something changed, especially after he got back from England. Yeah. Yeah, something's going on. Um, so, what convinces you the most? What, what, what of all the evidence or all the uh, research you've done and the papers and stuff? Um, what, what item kind of throws it over the edge for you? Well, the the first thing is when I first started, uh, the, uh, and, and all it was is the interest of him was that when I first heard that he had this uterus collection, I thought, well, that's pretty strange for people to have. And that he had this hatred of women, and but it was at the time where the other experts were saying that uh, there is no evidence of that, so that's why I got involved. And so then I was interested in to see if that's happening. And every time I turn over a stone to find new evidence, it's always damning. And then uh, so with uh, the first book, The Ripper's Haunts, it's actually I wrote it not to try to show that he was Jack the Ripper, but just that he was a Scout and Yard considered him a serious suspect. And that actually has worked. And and my goal is always to keep, not that he's Jack the Ripper, but he could very well be, be uh, the damning parts. And the couple of things that kind of kind of were stunners to me is, here it is, I'm almost done with re re uh, writing Jack the Ripper suspect, Dr. Francis Tumblety. The goal there was to get into, find out more about his history. If I could find, especially with serial killers, serial offenders, we know that, you know, uh, even if psychopathic behavior or sociopathic behavior, it starts when they're young. You know, psychopath more is a you know the bad egg, bad egg effect, but there's gen generally abuse there. So I'm going through all of his life to find out if I can find any of this stuff. And then so in the pattern uh, fits quite well in a lot of times, a lot of cases. But what really kind of shocked me was when I found out that 
uh, when we discovered this new material. Here it is that Richard Norris said that, uh, you know, Tumbley showed him his surgical knives and said that all streetwalkers should be disemboweled, and that was 1881. And it was like, oh, my gosh. Scotland Yard never knew this. And before I even, you know, like, I I almost was done with this book. And so this 900 pages could have had a ton of material that just pretty much canceled Tumbley out. It could have said... No, he was really, did us, you know, he told us that he was lying. You know, all that could have happened. But, so this material, the other thing is this material, I uh, passed it on to uh, one of the top experts is uh, Paul Begg. And because um, one of the things about being a suspect ripperologist is people automatically think that you're biased. And that's okay because all humans are biased. And so what I purposely want to do is I want to have people like Paul Begg look at it and do book review and rip me apart and look for the bias. And since he knows so much about Jack the Ripper, there's few people that know more about that, that him, that if it passes the muster with him, also Tom Westcott, the one, uh, the person you interviewed, yeah. the guy just knows so much about it. And so he had actually done a, a book review of mine as well. And uh, it's exciting to get positive book, uh, you know, book reviews like that. Oh, so, yeah. No, it's good to hear good things from... Um, from people that have different points of view, you know, or yeah, a lot right. of information, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, so what uh, what other response are you getting? Like, how, how's the public in general dealing with, with this? Do you hear anything from people? Uh, actually, a few things. One is uh, the, I just received uh, 2018, uh, the uh, book of the year for this book. And it was actually a group of uh, experts, and which uh, which is quite uh, I like that because this again this is a suspect book, and usually the experts like to uh, give more of a general expert. You know, like Tom uh, Tom Westcott. He if you look at his books, you know he he knows so much about the whole picture, and so he doesn't focus on any specific suspects like I do, and then so uh, they tend to avoid suspect. Uh, books to be like that way, and I, I got that. So it's pretty exciting about that. And then, um, but once uh, uh, in, on January 22nd, I'll be on the uh, Travel Channel with a, the new uh, a new series called Legend Hunter, and they sent me to uh, the UK to interview me for that. And so it was exciting to have that. And so what's happening is is um, the the material that's discovered. It's it's really in the expert community that have already done a lot of peer review in these books and what's what's fun to me is that there's always debate so everyone has their opinions and uh, expert opinions and I, I love that challenge and then so um, I it's, it's getting a very positive responses and, and as again so the the public I do definitely anybody that I've communicated with are really interested in, in this mystery, uh, material then, uh, but so it's the the experts as well that actually are connected with the public. Like another uh, Ripper cast with case coach Jonathan Mangies, he's uh, interviewed me a number of times, and he knows so much about this material. And he really purposely didn't tell me any questions, and uh, he was drilling me with questions. It was so fun because you know it, again, if if it's not correct, then I want to know about it so I can kind of fix it. To make sure that it is correct, you know. So it's really, uh, as again, we're the goal is reliable knowledge to understand uh, the truth behind everything. So any kind of inaccuracy, it has to get filtered out. And it's and it's all yeah. I I would say probably the biggest problem or the largest problem is that the uh, uh, investigations at the time were probably not. They didn't leave you with a whole lot of information. Yeah, you're right. The uh, and also that. Um, as I was saying, especially like what recently we found out about eyewitness testimony with the Innocence Project, that that they did not have fingerprinting at the time. They did not have fiber analysis. Of course, they did not have DNA analysis. Either beat a confession out of you, and but we've actually have over a dozen. We all have over a dozen confessions. So which one's right? <laughs> so yeah. oh, and then. You know. So, so, but it's exciting as kind of a, from a history perspective, as in learning more and more about it. Is like, you know, Tumbley really wasn't uh, was on the mind of Scotland Yard, 
And then uh, so to find out more about what was going on really kind of helps the bigger picture, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, much more um, reliable. Your, I mean, your book and information has been uh, great. Um, we've had some real wing dingers on, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So uh, this is uh, it's good to get someone that's uh, looking at more more information, more fact. Well, what's interesting is post book. I have you know I'm there's there's enough material for another one, and so I'm working with uh, Brian Young, who's a, an expert in the area. But we have uh, the uh, cool things that he act Tumbledy was actually uh, in communication, possibly patient of a an alienist. In New York City, uh, which is basically a psychiatrist or, or a neuroscientist at the time in New York City. And uh, that person is the, was the son of uh, the man that was the uh, Surgeon General at the time that people had asked him who was an, another alienist that, um, you know, what they thought, who, who they thought uh, the personality profile for Jack the Ripper was. And so here's the son who was actually an alienist as well. Uh, Graham Hammond is his name. William Hammond was the uh, the uh, Surgeon General, and so here's Graham, Graham Hammond having a relationship, communication with Tumblety. So you could see something was going on because uh, Graham Hammond was an expert at the uh, diseases of the brain, and then so and then I I found out we could really get conspiracies going because the year before the murders, Graham Hammond was in medical school at teaching medical school, and he claimed that he could get he could hypnotize. Any one of you medical, the medical, a medical student to kill somebody. So, so this was in a medical uh, report, and it shows that Graham Hammond hypnotized this guy and made him go crazy, just like this, this rage. And uh, so here it is. Oh, that'll be a perfect uh, maybe a fiction novel where he did it with Tumblety. <laughs> yeah, he's. A... <laughs> but but then but we're actually finding uh, more things that happened when Tumblety came back when a scout and yard detective followed him, and then what the investigation in the United States was about. He was at Tumblety was actually arrested uh, in February 1889 on the Ripper murders in New Orleans. And that's another thing. Uh, don't tell anybody, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, good luck. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what's your contact information that you want people to have in case they happen to see Jack the Ripper at the time? Maybe an eyewitness is still alive. Oh, that would be uh, my hub that I use as my website <laughs> is uh, is michaellholly.com. And then uh, when you go on there, you'll see uh, uh, like some uh, how you can get a hold of me, you know, like, you know, I'm on Facebook, and then uh, and it's got my email on there, and uh, so that's probably the, the the quickest way I would say is to contact me through that. So, any plans coming up next for you? Yes, the uh, couple things I do have a uh, uh, a book signing lecture Tuesday coming up here locally, and then I said on January 22nd I have some uh, uh, going to be on the Travel Channel, and then an Irish film director Jason Figgis is coming to America, and I. I uh, he asked me to help him out with uh, doing a documentary on Tumblety, so that's 2019. Uh, and he, we have done a uh, screenplay as well, and that uh, there is some interest in that as well, but based on my book. But it's going to be a, a fiction kind of thing. But uh, so the biggest thing would be probably the uh, the uh, the doc, another documentary coming up, yeah. and then uh, so. Well, fantastic. Um, well. What can I say? Michael Hawley, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you, Al. It was ex excellent, and I enjoyed speaking with you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.